The set containing elements of the form n over n plus 1 for all natural numbers n has a supremum of 1. And that's what we'll be proving in today's Wrath of Math lesson. Remember that the supremum of a set, if it exists, is the least upper bound. For this proof, we'll be using this equivalent definition of supremum that's pretty useful for supremum proofs, so get familiar with it. I'll leave a link in the description to a lesson where we prove this is equivalent to the original definition. This part of the definition says the supremum needs to be an upper bound, and the second part says that if we reduce the supremum at all, we no longer have an upper bound. Should make sense, because the supremum is the least upper bound. Let's just take a quick look at what the elements of this set actually look like. They're just n over n plus 1 for natural numbers n. So we'd have 1 over 1 plus 1, or 1 over 2, 2 over 2 plus 1, or 2 over 3, 3 over 3 plus 1, that's 3 over 4, and so on. Seeing these elements of this set, you may notice that it appears elements get closer and closer to 1 for larger values of n, which is why you might suspect the supremum is equal to 1 in the first place. Additionally, you might suspect that 1 half is the infimum of the set, which it is, and I'll leave that for you to prove. We'll go over it in a future lesson. All right, so how are we going to prove that 1 is the supremum of the set? Well, again, we're going to use this definition. So first, we have to prove that 1 is an upper bound of the set. And the rule of thumb for real analysis, if you don't know where to start, start with your result. We want to prove that 1 is an upper bound of s. So we want to prove that 1 is greater than or equal to n over n plus 1 for every natural number n. This, of course, seems intuitively obvious. You can't divide one number by a bigger number and get something that's bigger than 1. And if we multiply both sides of this inequality by n plus 1, we'll see exactly how we could be sure of that. Multiplying both sides by n plus 1 gives us that n plus 1 is greater than or equal to n. We know this is true, so we could start here and then divide divide both sides of the inequality by n plus 1 to get us to the desired inequality that 1 is indeed an upper bound. It's greater than or equal to n over n plus 1 for every natural number n. Once more, we would start here. We'd say we know that this is true for every natural number n, then divide both sides by n plus 1 to get the inequality we actually want to satisfy the first condition showing that 1 is indeed an upper bound of the set. All that remains is to show that for any positive number epsilon, 1 minus epsilon is not an upper bound of the set. So 1 is the least upper bound. We can't reduce it by anything in order to get another upper bound. And you definitely want to get used to reverse engineering your epsilon proofs. That's what we'll do a lot of in real analysis. By that, I mean we're again going to start with what we want to prove. If we're given an arbitrary epsilon greater than zero, we want to prove that there's some element of this set greater than 1 minus epsilon, so that 1 minus epsilon is not an upper bound. So we start with what we want. We want to show that there exists some natural number n that satisfies this inequality, so that n over n plus 1 is greater than 1 over epsilon. Then we want to manipulate this inequality into an equivalent inequality that has been solved for n. We need it to be equivalent so that we can go the other direction when we actually do the proof. Obviously, we can't start our proof with the conclusion, but this is really the work part of the proof, and then the rest is just writing it all in the opposite order. If you're not not sure what I mean? Don't worry, just follow along and you'll see where we are going. Once more, we want to solve this inequality for n so we can see what condition n has to satisfy to be the type of n that we desire. Let's add an epsilon to both sides of this inequality and subtract n over n plus 1 from both sides of the inequality. Doing that gives us epsilon is greater than 1 minus n over n plus 1. All right, now what can we do with this inequality? Well, let's simplify it a bit further. We could write 1 as n plus 1 over n plus 1 so that we have common denominators on the right. So epsilon is greater than n plus 1 
over n plus 1 minus n over n plus 1. Since these have common denominators, we could of course combine them into a single fraction. That would give us n plus 1 minus n over n plus 1, and of course the n minus n will cancel out. And so we're left with epsilon is greater than 1 over n plus 1. Then, if we multiply both sides of this inequality by n plus 1 and divide both sides by epsilon, we'll have that n plus 1 is greater than 1 over epsilon. Then we can subtract 1 from both sides to finish solving for n, and we have that n is greater than 1 over epsilon minus 1. So the idea is, if we can be sure that there exists a natural number satisfying this inequality, then we will know that natural number also satisfies this inequality that's actually important to us. 1 over epsilon minus 1 may be a very large number, for example, if epsilon is 1 over a billion and 1, then this is equal to a billion, but we can still find a bigger natural number. By the Archimedean principle, we know that given any real number, like 1 over epsilon minus 1, we can find a greater natural number, and I'll leave a link in the description to a proof of that principle. And that is how we could actually start our proof of the second condition for our supremum definition. We would say let epsilon be greater than zero, and then we can say that by the Archimedean principle, we know there exists a natural number n, so that n is greater than one over epsilon minus one. In the context of the proof, this kind of seems like a magic trick just taken out of nowhere. With no context, the reader would not know why one over epsilon minus one is is important. But since we did the work, we know that this is going to be exactly what we need for the proof to work out. So we just go back through these steps, but in reverse order. First, we could add 1 to both sides of the inequality, then invert both sides of the inequality. Note that is the same as dividing both sides by n plus 1 and multiplying both sides by epsilon. Then we add a weird form of 0 to the left side of the inequality. You see we've just added n and subtracted n in the numerator, so we haven't changed anything. However, now the left side of the inequality can be nicely rewritten. n plus 1 over n plus 1 is equal to 1. Then we would just have minus n over n plus 1 is less than epsilon. And then finally, we can subtract 1 from both sides of this inequality and then multiply both sides by negative 1. So we subtract 1 from both sides, then multiply both sides by negative 1. And finally, we are where we want to be. Remember the second condition of the supremum definition that we're using. We want to prove that given any positive epsilon value, if we subtract epsilon from 1, that will not be an upper bound of our set to finish proving that 1 is the supremum. And we just showed we can take any arbitrary positive epsilon value, and by the Archimedean principle, we know there will exist a natural number greater than 1 over epsilon minus 1. Then we showed that this natural number n would also satisfy this inequality that n over n plus 1 is greater than 1 minus epsilon. And thus, 1 minus epsilon is not an upper bound of our set, because n over n plus 1 must be an element of the set by its very definition, because our set contains all elements of that form for any natural number. So it definitely contains this one, which is greater than 1 minus epsilon, and so 1 minus epsilon is not an upper bound. And that completely the proof. We've shown that 1 is an upper bound, that's the first condition, and we've shown that if we reduce 1 at all, we no longer have an upper bound, that's the second condition. Thus, 1 is the least upper bound of this set, and so we can conclude that the supremum of the set is 1. So that means the elements of this set get arbitrarily close to 1. You could give me a number as close to 1 as you want, as long as it isn't equal to 1, and I could find you an element in this set that's even closer to 1. So I hope that helped you understand this proof for the supremum of a set. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions 
need anything clarified or have any other video requests. If you'd like to help support Wrath of Math so I can keep producing high quality math lessons, I'd really appreciate a small donation on PayPal or a small monthly pledge on Patreon. I'll leave links to those in the description. Thank you very much for watching, I'll see you next time, and be sure to subscribe for the swankiest math lessons on the internet.